I will go into uh, a bit of conceptual stuff about why this is needed, what's happening, and then I will go more into the thing. Uh, the core of the talk is about um, uh, a particular technique that allow us to speed up the ring sizes in Monero. Uh, so this is like more of a theory talk, but there is a very good uh, practical to talk that was made by Kayaba Nerve by Luke Parker, uh, where he implemented, uh, did a really good job implementing a lot of this stuff. So uh, I recommend people to see that speak and also to uh, look at his code that he just published. Okay, so I would just, uh, so right now we're in a, in a particular situation in crypto where the, originally in 2012, a lot of us thought that the agorist promise of crypto was an inevitability. Um, and, you know, laissez-faire, it, it will get made and things will just happen. And yeah, we're in 2023, and we still haven't realized that the core vision of what crypto is really about. And that's why uh, I'm here in this conference, the ethos that the Monero community embody. We're in a very special time because as well, post FTX, people are looking like, oh, where did everything go so wrong? You know, and people are seeking, now we're in that part of the cycle where people are seeking narratives that will form the basis of the next cycle. I saw some shills trying to go, it will be TradFi, haha. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Uh, so, yeah, what we foresee happening is that, you know, there is a side of crypto that is fragile. You know, it's all these pumpy projects where, you know, they play this game uh, and they create these big bloated teams and their business model is to like uh, uh, gather as many plebs and to tax all those plebs uh, versus true crypto, which is the, the kind of dark fire side of crypto, which is anti-fragile crypto. Anti-fragile crypto, the more the government cracks down, the state cracks down on it, the more stronger it becomes. Whereas fragile cr uh, crypto breaks under pressure. And right now, uh, we're, we're seeing um, the government start to crack down on crypto and we're seeing the increasing divergence of these two spheres, which will end in a end point where there will be a reg fi and there will be a dark fi. So, uh, yeah, so uh, dark fi, we also have a project called dark fi. And uh, also, not only are we in that, uh, that phase of crypto's life cycle where there's a return back to values, where people want to rediscover that what, which was lost, that gave us power uh, uh, also, now we're in a cryptography renaissance. The, the cryptography that people are creating, um, which is driven by, um, uh, uh, by uh, cryptocurrency or the investment into cryptography research, has really borne some powerful techniques. And these techniques are coming into the hands of developers. And we can use those techniques to hack and to construct anonymous applications. We can use, if you look up cryptography on wikipedia uh sorry no if you look up uh hard power on wikipedia it defines hard power as military and economic power but i think cryptography is a third new category and we can use these cryptography techniques to enlarge the space of freedom that's that's what agorism is agorism is using free markets to enlarge the space of freedom so uh also uh so let me just see. Oh my. Uh, so yeah, I don't have a slide for this. I should have. I forgot to put it. Uh, but um, now there is a window that's opening up, and the question is, can we be ready for that window to take to take charge of it? Because uh, if we can, and we can solve the Achilles heel in Monero, then privacy can come as a narrative to the forefront and uplift all of this side of crypto, agorist side of, of, of crypto. So, and also this new cryptography paradigm that's happening now 
uh, it's a new field that's emerging, a new field of anonymous engineering. Uh, a lot of the a, a lot of the techniques we use, uh, the basis is is algebraic. It's it's not uh, like old paradigm. So that's like a you know I don't want to get too much into uh, the evolution of uh, ZK techniques and how it's going into modularity, etc. But uh, okay, so yeah, so I mean ZK is one technique that's very important in this whole cryptography space. Uh, and right now, what we're seeing is increasing specialization. So the future of uh, cryptography looks like modular cryptography. There will be lots of different modules that you combine together, etc. And so, one thing I'm going to talk about is uh, set proofs. And set proofs is, you know, in Monero you have this uh, uh, ring, and okay, now there's a proposal that we can replace this ring using um, uh, curve trees. And in curve trees, and so this is why I want to illustrate in this talk about this specialization that's happening, is uh, you need to have a very fast elliptic curve in a product proof. So one way that we can we can do that, the so normal classical way is you like you build a circuit with those calculations, but right now all of the cryptography we use just uses very simple results from polynomial rings and you know elliptic curves but there is a vast expanse uh, out there of, of what's possible and so uh, and so we can I can give an I'm gonna there's a paper by Liam Egan where he talks about elliptic curve in a product proof using the Vi reciprocity rule and so um, that's very interesting because that's an indication of how we can start constructing new forms of cryptography or new forms of uh, proving systems, etc., using these higher geometrical or uh, mathematical properties. So, uh, so in mathematics, a uh, very important question in, in, in algebraic number theory is, okay, can we find uh, prime numbers that are uh, the sum of two squares? And one way to do that is you take uh, the field of quotients, which is basically all of the fractions where you have two integers, and you adjoin this uh, square root of one, uh, which is of minus one, sorry, which is i. And from that, you construct a field. And so then you can start using the machinery of algebra to start analyzing that field and going, okay, I want to find uh, prime numbers, P, which are the factor of two prime elements in this field. Uh, so then, you know, and so then, for example, uh, we can start to go, okay, we can start to look at this field and we can start to go, okay, what uh, properties does this uh, uh, field have? You know, does it have so, like, for example, when you have uh, a number like alpha and you divide that number by another number, uh, like, for example, if I have, uh, like, 10 divided by 3, then I will get 3.3333. And if I take the integer, which is closest to 3, and I minus it from that, then I get... 0 0.33, which is less than 1. So always, when you divide one number by another number, if you take the closest integer to it, then you get a remainder which is less than 1. And that property is called a Euclidean, Euclidean uh, uh, property, uh, or we call it a Euclidean domain. So our, qu our first question is, is this field QI a Euclidean domain? As you can see, that formalization for, for Euclidean domain on the bottom, where it goes, uh, alpha is equal to some k multiplied by a quotient plus a remainder. And this remainder has to be less than the, than the quotient. So that's another way of formalizing what, what I just said before. So, for example, if I show a, uh, where is it, number two. So, for example, in this book, 
uh, we can look at uh, page 126. Okay, let's zoom in. So you see, so we just, we just took that formula there and we just divide it by beta and we rearrange it. And you get this formula at, at the bottom here. Where's my mouse? Because I have no mouse. Oh, yeah. You see, you get this one here. And so, you know, I said before, you divide 10 by 3 and you, nearest, and you find the nearest integer and you, you, you deduct it and then you get a number here. This norm of this is less than 1. So why, why am I interested in this particular property of Euclidean domain on this field? Well, uh, it turns out that uh, if it's a Euclidean domain, then it also has unique factorization. And why do we want unique factorization? It's because we want to look at this field QI. We want to find primes that are the product of two primes. So we want to be able to, uh, we want to say, okay, this is a factorization that is unique of this field. And so solving this problem of finding two numbers at some, when they square to a prime, uh, there's, a, there's a very elegant proof of, of finding those, but it, relies on this particular property of unique factorization. So we already now found another property that implies unique factorization, which is Euclidean domains. But now our question is, is and, and so for example, uh, if, if, so for example here, we have, uh, you know, there might be other such fields that we look at. So here we have square root of minus three. If I zoom in, so where's my mouse? Here. So this is this is a lattice, um, and I can I can actually show. So where is it here? Actually, well, actually, anyway, this is this is the lattice, and so all of the points in this space, the, those points are points that are in that field of Q adjoined square root of minus three. And so then we can say, we can divide up this space and you say, okay, uh, are all of the points, do all of the points have a norm, which is less than one? So are they, is there distance to a point in this lattice always less than one? And so you can see that you can divide up the lattice into all these equal sections. You see this little uh, hexagon in the middle. And so then whatever I deduce about that hexagon is automatically true for the entire space. And so if I go here, for example, you can see that the norm is 0 0.5. So this is indeed a Euclidean domain. But you see, I can increase it. So if I, so for example, I increase to 11. If I go here, and it's, it's still a Euclidean, Euclidean domain. If I zoom in, I go just up here, suddenly you see it's 1.01. .01. So square root of minus 15 stops being a Euclidean domain. And you can see here it says uh, only these fields are Euclidean. Uh, minus 2, minus 3, minus 7, minus 11. So now our question becomes, okay, can we... Uh, are there other unique factorization domains? Because, okay, we proved that these are unique factorization domains, but are there others which aren't Euclidean but have that unique factorization property? And so that's when we start to create this construct called a class group. And so the class group is then we go, okay, uh, so, okay, now we're going to look at this in terms of ideals and we are going to take all of the group of ideals and we're going to, uh, we're going to uh, uh, quotient them by the group of, uh, of uh, principal ideals. So basically, if you have two ideals from this group, then the ideals are equivalent if uh, this, if, if you have, if, if when you move the, the B to the other side, you have AB minus one, that there is some element that is in the principal group. And so what this tells us then is, uh, so okay, if we look, uh, if, 
basically, uh, if you have, so we had this on the previous thing. And one way of looking at that product is as a product of ideals. And so we can take any element in that field, we can, re we can reduce it to uh, these objects, which are ideals, and then we go, okay, uh, if this ideal can be represented by one object, then it actually represents an element in the field. So that's why we're looking at principal ideals is because we're only interested in the ideals that represent a, sing a single object. So then our question goes, okay, how much does this entire field deviate from being principal? And so that's why we construct that group thing there because if the, uh, if the entire thing is principal, then the size of the group would just be one. There'll be only an identity element because all the elements are the same as the principal elements. And if none of the elements are principal, then the size of that group will be the same as the, the size of the ideal group. So this actually gives us a measure, how much does this uh, ideal group deviate from being principal? And we use that as, as, as a measure of, of that. So, uh, and, and, and so there's a lot of very interesting cryptography that people use using this, which is like ideal uh, uh, class groups. So, um, uh, and let me wait like this. Okay, is that too, maybe too small? Okay, so then to do computations, just as an aside on this ideal class group, we use something called uh, uh, quadratic forms. And it's, and it's very interesting because there's actually an isomorphism from the, oh yeah, this one, from the ideal uh, to the class group. And you can also see the other way around. This is the quadratic form. And then this forms the ideal in the ideal class group. And also, uh, there is, so then these forms, so you basically have, so you can basically show that a form which is like ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared with some uh, additional restrictions uh, under action by this matrix group SL2 is uh, equivalent to ideal class group. So you can take this thing, which is an ideal class group, which is very abstract. There is an isomorphism to this thing called a binary quadratic form. And then you can do explicit computations on them. And, uh, and the interesting thing about the forms is there is an algorithm that if I give you any form from one of these uh, cosets of the ideal class group, I give you a form, I could generate this one randomly. There's an algorithm that you run, which is this algorithm, that you run it, you will end up with a single representative of this coset. The, co the representative will be reduced, and you can show that uh, there's always a bound, like a, uh, it's below a certain bound. So that's why it become practical to do computation on, um, on, on quadratic forms. So, you can't see there, but there, there's, so the way that uh, we, op we, we can move between uh, items within this coset is using uh, this special matrix group called SL2. So all of the forms which share the same discriminant, which is on the right, they're within the same coset. So you see there's a, there's a form on the right, seven minus 10, four, and I can just, I can apply different values and it's like a little game that I can do to try and reduce that. So let's see if I, if, let's see if I can do that. No. I can't remember like what reduction I have to. Anyway, when I'm s sitting by myself, I, I reduced it once again. Anyway, there's a way to let's see if I, no. ah, there you go, I reduced it. And that's the final reduced form one, zero minus three. You see, I applied this, and that's how the matrix, the final matrix, which is, as you see at the top, T squared ST, 
and at the top right is the actual matrix that you apply to the original form, and you get this final form within the uh, coset. So, uh, okay, so moving on. Uh, so then that same concept of the ideal class group, because uh, you know, like, people doing algebraic geometry, people doing algebraic number theory, um, they're, a lot of it's very similar, so people go like, oh, that's a good idea in algebraic geometry, you can use that in to do number theory calculations, and then vice versa in algebraic geometry. So it's a lot of the same machinery and concepts transfer over, and so then people bring this idea to elliptic curves where they start going, okay, so there is this object in elliptic curve called a divisor, and what we're interested in, we're interested in functions over a function field, and we go, okay, uh, there is some curve that we have, like an elliptic curve, and we're interested in this function, this other function as well, uh, but we're not interested in the function itself, we're interested in the function restricted to the elliptic curve, so the, the zeros where the function intersect the elliptic curve. And so then uh, we, we can actually represent those functions using uh, this object called divisors, and, uh, and then we say that, you know, there are, div and, and so one of the properties of a, of a divisor is that always the degree and the sum are, are zero, and uh, then we can construct this class group of elliptic curves where uh, we take the divisors, all the divisors that are possible, and we quotient it out by the divisors that are principal. And, uh, and so you can see it's very similar to the class group here, it's just, it's, it's nice for elliptic curves, and you see the multiplicative notation has changed the additive. And we say the two divisors are equivalent if their difference is part of this uh, uh, principal group. So, see so it's a generalization uh, of, of, that, of that concept. And so, uh, and so then, uh, inside of this divisor group, now it has its own properties, and we study those, and mainly people use this for pairings. But there's a lot of very interesting uh, uses of this. So, in, for example, uh, this proof, the elliptic curve in a product argument, one of the properties of the divisor group is that uh, when it, it has this Vi reciprocity rule, which is the rule at the top, which is when you take f of the divisor of g and you evaluate it at g of the divisor of f, they're both equivalent to each other. And that's due to the algebraic structure, which inside of algebraic geometry, they have something called the resultant. And the resultant is used to find when you have two functions in the function field, you use it to find, do these functions have a common factor? Or are these functions co-prime to each other? What it, what it means co-prime, it means they don't have a common factor. So there are some quotients you can find for f and g, that went, like a f plus b g, such that they're equal to one. That means because they're not in an ideal of, the, of that group. Anyway, you can, so this vi reciprocity rule, which is defined over these like abstract divisors, you can actually define it, you can define it very computationally uh, using uh, resultants. And, uh, and so resultants, you can see, so we've got P, which, P1 up to Pm, which are the zeros of G, and we've got P1, so we've got Q1 up to Qn, which are the zeros of F. So we have this reciprocity between these two things. And so if, so then in this proof, I, w I, have, a, I, have, a, um, I have a divisor, and I want to prove that this divisor is a principal divisor. So we had this class group bef before here, and I was like, okay, I've got an element of, 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 of this group, but I want to prove actually this element is in the zero of this group. So one way that you can do it is you know that um, uh, if, if there's a divisor that's, that's principal, then it will, have, it will obey this reciprocity rule. So the way that it's constructed is that he have uh, the, there is a line which is a challenge point, which is a uh, challenge to the protocol by the uh, verifier, and you have your curve, which you have a function, and you have a certain set of zeros, and you're trying to prove those zeros are the zeros of that function. So then you can evaluate uh, the, the verifier's line against your points, which is, is 
your points are Q, and his line is G, and you can do the, you can do the same for F, which is your curve, and the points of the line, which is going to be three points, because a elliptic curve and a line intersecting three points by uh, Bazout's uh, theorem. And so, uh, yeah, so then we have now this uh, statement at the bottom, which is multiplicative. But actually, we can do another speed up, which is we can turn this multiplicative statement into an additive statement. So then we have this very nice function, which is called a discrete log. And so the discrete log is defined as, as above at the top, which is you take the derivative of u and you divide it by u. So we can actually see that if we have the d of u times v, then if we, if we put it here on the right, we apply the same rule above, we get the derivative of uv divided by uv. And then if we expand that out using the, I think it's the chain rule, uh, then you can see we get u dash v over plus v dash u divided by uv. And if you split those two on the left and the right, then you get u dash v, you get, sorry, u dash divided by u plus v dash divided by v, which you see at the top is equal to d, u plus dv. So we turned a multiplicative statement, which is uv, into this other statement, which is uv. And so then the proof operate on top of the discrete discrete log. So, uh, and so then uh, this approach to do it is, is very interesting. And we can actually uh, do, we can do more stuff with this. So that entire machinery, we could, we could use it to construct proofs of statements about uh, divisor class groups. So for example, now I'm very interested in hyperelliptic divisors because uh, hyperelliptic curves of genus three, they have unknown order. And so then you can start using also the group order as a, a trapdoor function as well. And you can do interesting things with that. And also, yeah, unknown order groups. And then also now there's been a very interesting uh, trend of uh, creating additional operators inside of uh, ZK proving machinery. So, uh, and, and then also in general, um, where a lot of this is going is, because it's still a very new nascent paradigm, and I see a lot of people creating ZK languages where there's like a Turing complete or like superficially uh, like smart contract style language to write circuits. But the paradigm is very different. So uh, the tooling that we're going to create is still very nascent. Uh, but also, like a lot of the tuning of circuits is done by hand. So, for example, uh, if I do uh, elliptic curve multiplication and I use a lookup table, there's like a, it's a fixed size the lookup table I add to the circuit and it automatically pushes my circuit to a certain size. And you have all these like uh, gadgets that you like put onto the circuit, but they're all predefined size. And there's not really, right now, tool chains which are, are taking those statements and be able to convert them uh, into, into algebraic ones and optimize them. So we're still very early with, with all of this stuff. It's really untapped and, and unex, unexplored space so yeah uh so yeah uh so you know monero why can't like what's stopping it being the store of value it would just if we fix the ring size then there's no reason for bitcoin it would be li literally monero uh uh so that's that's why we need to uh, uh fix that and um, and now we have this new cryptography, uh, very powerful techniques, which developers can wield. And that has opened up uh, a new design space. And our thesis that we published two years ago, you can search Rect News, uh, Lunar Punk. You know, it's a five minute video. You should watch that video. It's, it's from two years ago. Literally, we, re we released it, and then Z the tornado cache got taken down. And at this point, it's, uh, you know, we, we published that two years ago. At this point, it's practically inevitable. The, 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 the dark fire side, the agorist side of crypto, uh, 
uh, is 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 going to rally. Like we need to like mobilize as a movement. You know, we need to move towards our objectives. So Satoshi, he said, uh, we can win a major battle in the arms race and gain a new territory of freedom for several years. So thanks. <laughs> <laughs>